clarity on the coaching staff. Yes, late last week we had an announcement on most of the staff, but today we get a finalized staff. We know who the pitching coach. Is it Andrew Bailey or is it not? Uh, I'm going to give you that answer and talk about the rest of the staff next. You are Locked On Giants, your daily San Francisco Giants podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome to Locked On Giants, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, where it's your team every day. My name is Ben Kaspik, and on this show, we provide daily episodes Monday through Friday, talking about the San Francisco Giants in a way that's data-driven and rational, but also simple, passionate, and accessible to all. I'm a former contributor for the baseball statistics and analysis websites, Beyond the Box Score, and Rotographs. I've been podcasting about the Giants since 2015, and I'm a lifelong fan. Thank you for making Locked on Giants your first listen every day. We just so happen to be free and available wherever you get your podcasts, including YouTube. Check us out there, and also please hit that subscribe button wherever it is that you're following the show. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 money line bet. That's $150 if your team wins. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to get started. More on that later. So coming up on today's show, yes, clarity on the coaching staff as a couple of major, I mean, we we had a lack of clarity, even though we uh, had a lot, you know, we knew Pat Burrell was joining the team as uh, a hitting, a co-hitting coach with Justin Veely, who was sticking around, which was somewhat, I don't want to say controversial, but maybe somewhat unexpected. Um, we, they didn't have a pitching coach though, in the, in terms of that initial round of announcing who was going to be there. And I discussed how, you know, the possibility of Andrew Bailey seeking another opportunity may have been what was holding that up. And then I was also surprised that Brian Price, who had been linked to this job, wasn't announced and so but today we get the clarity and what the clarity is is that it's brian price and that it's not um andrew bailey so bailey i thought i mean they've lost brian bannister to the chicago white Sox, and now they've lost andrew bailey whom uh maria guardado says of sfgiants.com by the way she says that uh andrew bailey uh held the role for the past four seasons, but is now pursuing coaching opportunities closer to his family on the East Coast. And somewhere I read that he had just interviewed for the Yankees bench coach position. And so Andrew Bailey, I think, showed well as Giants pitching coach. And this, again, I just like feel like Gabe Kapler deserves credit for putting the staff together that he, together that he put together. Um because a lot of these guys, like Donnie Ecker, Brian Bannister, now Andrew Bailey, a lot of them were like first timers too. Like Ecker, I guess he had. Anyway, that's neither here nor there. But thank you, Andrew Bailey. So many coaches uh, moving on here. Dustin Lind has kind of been let go. I think Bailey, it's more of like a mutual, not even mutual. I think it's more Bailey's preference to be closer to family. And so Brian Price. This guy has so much experience, and he's worked with Bob Melvin so many different times. It's crazy. Like uh, they they started working together in uh, the early two thousands. I'm looking for where it is in the article. I was reading about it. I can kind of say it off memory, but when Bob Melvin first started managing, because he's been managing over two decades, he uh, Brian Price was the pitching coach, I believe, in Seattle. And he's been all over the place. He was in Arizona with Bob Melvin. He was with the Cincinnati Reds, where he was a manager for a number of years. And he has spent the past two years working as a senior advisor to Melvin's staff in San Diego. And he's going to return to uniform for the first... He was a manager of the Reds from 2014 to 2018, by the way. And he was also pitching coach 
for the Reds, I believe, at times. So Brian Price has been around, and he's a native. He's a native. And this is what Bob Melvin had to say on a Zoom call with reporters on Tuesday. Uh, that uh, Quote, I don't know that there's another job on a major league staff that he, Brian Price, would have taken other than this one. Mill Valley, went to Cal, similar to myself and other guys, you hope at some point in time you end up in the dugout of the San Francisco Giants. So I had no idea. Like I've known of Brian Price forever because um, he's just been around so long. You would think he's like 100 given all that experience. I guess you would think maybe the same of Melvin. But Price is 61 years old just brings a huge amount of experience to the role. And so overall, this staff, when it kind of has taken shape, it is a more experienced staff, just like Bob Melvin himself is a far more experienced manager. And so I think this is than Kapler was. And so they're, you know, I think it's a good, I think overall it's a good staff. I do have some questions and concerns about the the hitting group um, because they struggled so much last year they seem to have struggled just basically ever since Donnie Ecker left but they're continuing to put a lot of faith in Justin Veely and Pat Burrell um, Farhan Zaidi did comment on Burrell in this Zoom call and just kind of talk about Oh, the quote is right here. He's on Burl. He said, I've been really impressed with his ability to connect with players, not just be a hitting mechanics guru, but also understand the psychological part of the game, the cheerleading aspect of the game, respecting how hard hitting is. I think for Pat to bring that wealth of experience and the connections and relationships he has with our young players, because Pat Burrell has been like a roving hitting or uh, instructor. So he's been like bouncing around between the affiliates, the minor league affiliates, and kind of working with hitters. And so Farhan says, relationships he has with our young hitters, it's just going to be a boost to our hitting group. We have a lot of confidence and belief in the job that Justin Veeley and Pedro Guerrero have done the last few years. When we've been good, we've been really, really good. Obviously, this past year was a struggle, but it's not for a lack of effort or work on their part. So I still, um, you know, the proof will be in the pudding. Like, can they turn it around and be better? Was it just about the personnel? They just didn't have good enough players? Or was it, is there, is Justin Beely just not up on the same standard as Donnie Ecker? Donnie Ecker, by the way, has said Justin Beely and co are like the best in the world. And so we'll, we'll see. We'll see. But then the other I haven't even mentioned yet. Bullpen coach, Garvin Alston. Um, a lot of people know of Gar- Garvin Alston. I don't really know much about him. I, I know that he was the pitching coach in Sacramento the last several seasons. And so, again, a lot of experience working with uh, players who are in the big leagues now when we talk about Kyle Harrison and we talk about Tristan Beck and Keaton Wynn, Garvin uh, Alston has, and, and I may be mispronouncing his name. I'll have to obviously um, look into that. But it's uh, uh, he's beloved, and he takes over for Craig Albernaz. And uh, in terms of they had a director of pitching, like I said, Brian Bannister, and Farhan Zaidi said that the team doesn't have definitive plans, quote, definitive plans to replace Bannister, though he noted that Brian Price will have input in pitching programs across the organization along with player development staffers Justin Lear and Clay Rapata. I believe Clay Rapata was a former player. Maybe Justin Lear was as well. Anyway, so that's the staff. I'll just, I guess, run through it really quick. Bob Melvin, obviously, and then 11 coaches Ryan Christensen, as they their pronunciation guide was really weird. Christensen is how I would say it normally. Matt Williams, third base coach. Mark Hallberg moves to first base from third base. Brian Price is the new pitching coach. J.P. Martinez, assistant pitching coach. Garvin Alston, bullpen coach. Justin Veeley and Pat Burrell, co-hitting coaches. 
Pedro Guerrero, assistant hitting coach, Alyssa Nakin, and Tyra Uimatsu are assistant coaches. So there you have it. I think overall it's a solid group. So coming up in just a minute, though, we're going to switch gears and talk all about the Rule 5 draft. Not the draft itself, but the Giants protected three par- uh, prospects from this draft by adding them to the 40-man roster. Who were they? Why did they did it? Why did they do it? Were there any surprises? We'll get into it in just a minute. And before we do, today's episode is brought to you by none other than the very best, our great friends over at FanDuel. Score score early like the Niners on Sunday. This NFL season with FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 money line bet. That's a hundred and fifty bucks if your team wins, and that's just kind of insane. And you look at uh, the upcoming 49ers game, and I'm looking at the odds on FanDuel right now. The money line for the Niners, I mean, there's got to they might this might be the most lopsided if, of any game uh, in the NFL this upcoming week. The Niners at minus six seventy. You just place a five dollar bet on that, and if the Niners win, you get a hundred and fifty. In bonus bets by first visiting fanduel.com slash locked on. So anyway, if you've been thinking of joining FanDuel, I promise you there's no better time to get in on the action. The app is easy to use, wide range of betting options, not just money lines, but so much more. So again, visit fanduel.com slash locked on and kick off the NFL season. FanDuel official partner of the NFL. All right, here we go. We are going to get into the prospects protected in the Rule 5 draft. Thanks again for making Locked on Giants your first listen every single day. And just jumping right into who these prospects were, uh, I've got to like pull out the official uh, press release here. The Giants announced... They said, the Giants have added the following players to the 40-man roster. Right-handed pitcher, Trevor McDonald. Left-handed pitcher, Eric Miller. Right-handed pitcher, Kai Wei Tang. The Giants' 40-man roster currently stands at 39. And so that means, essentially, they can make one addition before they have to start, like, DFAing people. Or they can make trades. But anyway, the, the, the significance here is adding these three players. And I'm going to just... I know that Roger listens to the show, and I appreciate that. Roger Munter, uh, one of the, you know, go-to, like, if not the go-to voices for uh, Giants prospect land, Giants prospectum, uh, Raj is all over it. And so we're in this uh, Discord together, and he had this to say about these decisions to add these three. I'm going to quote him here. He says, Miller was an, was an easy call. Left-handed pitcher who throws 99 and has a three-pitch mix, especially given what they have on hand. Tang, Kaiwei Tang, huge strikeout numbers, equally big walk numbers, throws a ton, a ton of innings. Could slot into the jelly, Sean Jelly role of come up and soak up some bad innings here and there. McDonald is the interesting one. He's been really dominant when he pitches, but uh, some little stuff has kept him out a lot. Chance to be really good and maybe a starter. Zaidi said he could be on the MLB team next year, which seems a little aggressive, but he's got a lot going for him. Big repertoire, fastball around 96, 97, funky delivery that has deception. Uh, Third highest signing bonus in 2019, though, taken in 11th round. Okay, so they've been high on him since they drafted him, essentially. And so with Miller being the easy call, that's going to be where we're going to start. So left-handed pitcher Eric Miller, just going to pull up uh, the stats on Eric Miller. Now that we have the scouting report from Roger Munter, again, thank you for that scouting report. Um, is Fangraphs down again? Because I've got a mil- No, it's not down again. Thank goodness. I've got a million tabs open. It's hard sometimes to keep track. But Eric Miller, so he pitched 
in double A and triple A this year for the Giants. And uh, I mean, he also had his share of command issues. Um, pure reliever. So um, he like he didn't make a single start last year. And the strikeout numbers were kind of bonkers. But he had uh, walk issues. You know, he, his walk rate was 18 and a half percent. But if we are talking, this is like where kind of scouting is important and it's not just about the numbers. Left-handed pitcher throws 99 and has a three-pitch mix. Yeah, those guys are easy calls to protect. And, I mean, he ended up with a 277 ERA despite walking over seven guys per nine innings, but was like impossible to hit homers against in a hitter-friendly environment. So uh, there you have it. Eric Miller, lefty reliever 65 240 is what he's listed as and he gets added to the 40 man which means you know he's in that mix for that for a bullpen role uh certainly as early as next season kaiway tang we've known about this guy for a long time as he was acquired way back in farhan zaidi's first season um at the trade deadline uh they acquired him from the minnesota twins and so he's been he's been in the organization a while now, and he's going to be 25 in like two weeks. Um, and yeah, he did put up big strikeout numbers. He spent 2023 in Double A AA and Triple A, but unlike Eric Miller as a starter, primarily he every outing but one was as a starter. Um, uh, he had less of a walk issue than Eric Miller, it seems. Um, but, but yeah, striking out close to 30% of batters. If you combine double a and triple a, it's about there. It was over 30%, 33.7 in double uh, a, and then 27.6 in triple a, but the walk rate has, has always kind of been an issue ever since 2021. Really. It's been over 10% and, between 10 and 15 percent you want to be down like at eight or so to be average so worse than average command but good stuff evidently by the strikeout numbers so again it's like a mop-up kind of role potentially but he gets added to that 40-man roster and then the surprise the surprise being mcdonald and that would be trevor mcdonald and so we are going to pull up the numbers after reading the scouting report on Trevor McDonald, if Fangraphs would allow us to. And yes, wow, born in 2021, uh, 2019 pick, like Roger said. And uh, <laughs> I mean, this season in high A, we're talking a guy who's only reached high A. And so that's, what, that's why this is a surprise. Um, but, you know, I heard Farhan Zaidi comment on this a little bit in the zoom meeting with reporters that uh trevor mcdonald dealt with injuries as roger said and that if he hadn't he'd probably be kind of closer to the big leagues and more of a slam dunk case because actually zaidi called kaiway tang and um eric miller like easy decisions and trevor Mc, maybe he even said mcdonald was or he said he would i forget exactly who he said was what but at least two of them he said were easy decisions but for miller the like part of the equation with with protecting players from the rule five draft is not always about how good they're gonna be and how good even other teams think they're gonna be it's about also proximity to the major leagues because the rules of the Rule 5 draft are that the team that takes them, and by adding these guys to the 40-man, the Giants have protected teams, have protected themselves from teams taking these players from them when that draft happens in right after the right at the end of the winter meetings in a couple weeks. Uh, I forget. I actually forget where I was going with that, but... Um, oh, no, I don't. The The point isn't just about how good teams think they're going to be, including their own team, but it's about proximity to the major leagues. And so a guy who's only played in high A, you know, 
you don't always protect those guys because the team that takes them has to have them in the major leagues all season long. Just like Blake Sable. Like, it's actually pretty rare that a Rule 5 pick lasts all season on the major league team. They end up getting offered back like most of the time. And even rarer that they end up having successful careers after being taken in the Rule 5 draft. Um, so anyway, the numbers are nasty, though. I mean, in high A, the num- and, and as a starter, 9 out of his 8. Eight out of his nine appearances were as a starter, and yeah, 37 innings. So we're not talking just one or like two inning starts, you know. So numbers were nasty. Walk rate was very good. Strikeout rate was very good. ERA was 096. And so look, I'm not, I mean, it's a surprise given how potentially far away, but like Roger said, Farhan Zaidi said that this guy could pitch in the major leagues next year. And so to move from high, that would be a stretch, but, uh, I mean, Zaidi himself said it. So there you have it. So those three protected, there are others who were not protected. Um, and they're subject to being taken in the rule five draft. RJ Dabovich comes to mind. Um, once thought of as kind of a slam dunk back end reliever type, I think. And, He'll probably be taken, I think, in that Rule 5 draft. And so that'll be interesting to see who the Giants lose. But you also end up getting guys back a lot of the time because they don't stick. It's hard to stick. Like if Blake Sable had struggled, for example, like really struggled, you have no choice. You just have to give up on them and offer them back to the team you took them from. And the team can say, all right, we'll take them back. And that's that. So anyway, with all of that being said, coming up in just a minute, I want to pay tribute to a man who has nothing to do with the San Francisco Giants, but it's a baseball story. And we're going to pay tribute to a man who lost his life today um, and who is a important person in the industry. And so we'll get into that whole story in just a minute. And before we do... All right, as promised, we're going to get into the legacy of Peter Seidler, the owner of the San Diego Padres, um, who tragically passed away today at the age of 63 um, due to an undisclosed medical issue, obviously a medical issue. Um, And by the way, thanks again for making Locked on Giants your first listen every day. I know my schedule's been super wonky with episodes coming out late. That should change starting next week as I'm going to be internationally traveling, which will create its own complications. But I think it's going to be more mornings. So just bear with me. I've just moved. If you are wondering, my background is different, all that kind of stuff. Anyway, moving forward, Peter Seidler Uh Young, at 63 years old, just kind of disappeared in August. We knew that he had some undisclosed medical procedure. And then we find out today that he's died. And so it's it's very sad. And the reason, I mean, anytime anybody that age, it just feels too young. But what the reason this is relevant on a Giants podcast is because Peter Seidler represented the best of what major league owners can be in that he, uh, he, he wanted to win. He wanted a great team and he just went out there and went after the best players and paid top dollar for it. Uh, went after, you know, Juan Soto in a trade, you know, he, Owners are behind, they have to approve everything. And, you know, this guy clearly just wanted the best players almost no matter the cost. You you look at, like he came in, he was part of the ownership group, but he took, uh, he bought a a majority stake in uh, 2020, at the end of 2020. So he became the, uh, what did he become? The control person. He was approved 
to be the control person in San Diego and and he was the majority owner after 2020. And then what did they do? It wasn't they didn't stop at uh, Manny Machado, who they already had. But, you know, they gave out a huge extension to Fernando Tatis Jr. I don't know. I actually can't remember if that was before or after the end of 2020. But they also have, again, made that trade for Juan Soto. And then they went out there and they tried to sign Aaron Judge at the last minute. And they ended up uh, signing Xander Bogarts to this huge contract. And so uh, the Padres are not a huge market team. And so a lot of people were like, where is this money coming from? And part of the story is like reports are they had to take out a $50 million loan actually at the end of the season to cover their payroll. And now they're going to be trimming their payroll going into next year. So it is a bit complicated. The legacy, I mean, not, the legacy is not complicated of Peter Seidler, but the Padres situation last year and moving forward is complicated and uncertain, but what is certain is that Peter Seidler wanted to win and he just said, I want the best players and I'll pay for it. And too often we don't see that in the sport and the giants lie somewhere in the middle in that they're not the A's. They're not a team that just like refuses to spend money at all. That's definitely not the case. And if you think that's the case, you're just over, you're totally um, lying to yourself because they had an agreement on a $350 million contract with a player just last off season. And it fell apart due to a freak thing, but st- like the A's would never, ever, ever sign a player for a hundred million, much less 350 million. Um, but so the giants though, they've been more cautious, right? And I think that everybody, around the league like fans like he was he became like a hero kind of like Steve Cohen in New York but a, a hero among San Diegans if that's the right way to call them um for his commitment to winning and for just commit commitment to not just winning cuz they didn't win like that's the thing is even this year they didn't win but they set a franchise record for attendance in a year in which they went 82 and 80 and it took getting red hot at the end of the year just to squeak out a barely over 500 season but that's the thing is you 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 know i've said at times that just win like you don't even need star talent just win and that's what's going to drive people to the park But on the other hand, the Padres are an example of somewhat of the opposite, which is like, even if you don't win, if you have a truly star laden team, because these aren't like has beens, it's not like, oh, these guys are big names, but they're not actually good. These guys are actually good and they're playing for the Padres. And so if you're in San Diego and you're a Padres fan and even like a casual fan, you want to come out and watch this team, even though they weren't performing well. And that's exactly what people did. And so I think as Giants fans, we can particularly relate to the uh, like total opposite of having a team that just makes you feel like you have to show up and, and like they're a destination. You know, like the Golden State Warriors are like that. I think the 49ers are like that now. Uh, the Giants have not been like that since... Like even in the 107 win season, as great as it was, it, they weren't like a must see team. I mean, it was must see in the winning sense, but the star talent and just like the pure entertainment value of the names and and just you know it it just wasn't. I'm not gonna knock a 107 win season, but anyway, Peter Seidler is responsible for all of that in San Diego, and so his death is just really sad. Like I feel for that fan base and obviously for his loved ones and his family. Uh, Apparently it was reported by AP Associated Press that he had like had in the past, like he had beaten cancer twice or something. So I don't, who knows what the cause was, but he kind of disappeared in August unknown undisclosed medical 
procedure or something. And so anyway, I just am paying my respects to a guy who, despite being a division, the owner of a division rival, I think he elevated, he stepped, he raised the bar and, you know, made Giants fans feel justified in saying, we want that, you know, and, and for good reason. And so in a small market, like they're not a huge market, San Diego at all. And they have consistently run among the lowest payrolls in the game until recently. And this year they were up there third highest. And so anyway, I know obviously with the Giants, we've got the break even comments over and over, not not hiding the fact that their goal is to break even. It goes to show you though that like if you're not breaking even, like the Padres are fifty million in the red and they had to take on a loan. Like just because your team is worth a lot of money, you still need the cash to make the payments. Like you owe money for payroll and such. And so anyway, that breaking even, you can't just be losing money otherwise it's like coming out of your own pocket but i i don't know i don't know i'm not an economics expert but anyway rest in peace peter seidler gone too soon that is all the time we have for today thanks again for making locked on giants your first listen every day promise the schedule will get uh back more to normal we are, we're approaching the winter meetings uh and so Expect the rumors to pick up and maybe some stuff to actually happen. Nothing has really happened yet, but be on the lookout for any Giants rumors at all. We'll cover it. We're also doing mailbags and all that stuff uh, leading up to the winter meetings, which are usually where stuff happens. And the Giants figure to be active this offseason. They've been active, even if they haven't landed the huge fish, even the last several years. And so active again, and hopefully a huge fish as well. Once again, my name is Ben Kaspic. Check me out on Twitter at Ben Kaspic, K-A-S-P-I-C-K. If you like this show, please consider rating it or leaving a review. It helps me out a lot. So thank you in advance. Thank you to everyone who's done so already. I can't wait to be with you again tomorrow. Thanks again for listening. You are now Locked on Giants.